What's the most horrible way to die that you've ever heard of that has actually happened? That guy that walked 700 meters off the boardwalk in Yellowstone with his sister and slipped into a boiling, acidic geyser comes to mind. That guy who jumped in a boiling geyser to save his dog also comes to mind. When they pulled him out he had third degree burns over 100% of his body while he was still alive and conscious enough to realize he effed up. When his friend pulled him out he said something along the lines of that was stupid. How bad am I? I'm an idiot. Like even though his nerve endings were probably shot pretty instantly once he was in there the idea that he was able to realize that he was going to die is effed up. Dude tries to blow his head off with a shotgun. The first shot just blows most of his jaw off, but he lives. He gets up, walks to the bathroom mirror, looks at himself, reloads and finishes the job. That moment of looking in the mirror must have been pure hell. My aunt died in a car fire. She was driving drunk and went off the road and crashed her car. A fire started and the car was damaged to point where she could not exit. Firefighters arrived and one tried to pull her out by her arm but only got skin. It's awful to think about. Similar thing happened to a friend of mine. Many many years ago when she was a toddler. She was in the car with her mother. They were in an accident and the car was wrecked. Her mum couldn't get out when a fire started. The mum climbed into the back seats and cloaked her body over that of my friends. By the time emergency services got there the mum was gone and my friend survived but she was badly injured with burns over the majority of her body. Or there's always being skinned alive. Aka fling. Generally the victim starts with being left naked out in the hot sun for a day or two in order to get severe sunburn. If it's winter or just bad weather, a quick dunk in boiling water does the same thing. They are then strung up by the hands and a very sharp knife is used to make long straight incisions. The burn helps separate the skin from the underlying connective tissue. The skin is then peeled off from the muscle and large sheets using a hot knife. Between the burn and the hot knife, a skilled flayer could remove the skin with minimal blood loss, meaning the victim did not bleed out. Most common actual cause of death would then be hypothermia, as the skin is a vitally important part of your body's ability to regulate its temperature. Or if they were super unlucky they'd die of sepsis, blood poisoning due to infection, as much as days later, and of course the victim would be kept conscious during the entire procedure. In Afghanistan there was a 12 year old girl, 14 years old Max, that poured gasoline over herself and set herself on fire because her parents were forcing her to marry a 60 ish year old man. Worst part about it is not being able to do anything to help her. Also the monk in Vietnam protesting his government in the 1960s. Since someone already said scafism, my second worst one is, strychnine poisoning. It can be inhaled, consumed, or absorbed through wet tissue, like the nose, mouth, or eyes. It causes your voluntary nervous system to go into overdrive, which makes every muscle in your body contract and spasm uncontrollably. These spasms can be strong enough to rip the muscles off your bones. If untreated, death usually comes within 2-3 hours either from asphyxiation, your chest muscles spasm so hard your ribs cannot expand, or from sheer exhaustion, there is no antidote to strychnine. Although if caught immediately you can be put in sensory deprivation on massive doses of muscle relaxers, if you survive the first 24 hours, you usually live if. The story is extremely sad, also pretty disturbing so I should put a TW on this. Back when I was in 7th grade, I had this friend, Laser, who was a year older than me. He had 3 siblings 2 of which were much, much younger. He also lives pretty close to where I live. It's important to note that we live on the countryside. One day, while we're at school, the principal and the teachers are freaking out. Kids are starting to cry. I asked one of the kids what happened, and I just kind of stood there horrified for a moment. Turns out that Laser's father was out on the field on a combine harvester working with his friend. When something got stuck in the rotary thresher, Laser's dad went back there to check it out. But after a while his friend figured he was done and just decided to turn the harvester back on. However, his leg sleeve got caught up in the thresher and started to quickly pull him in. Basically crushing his leg and soon enough, his other leg as well. By the time his friend heard the screams and stopped the harvester, both of his legs were ripped off of his body and crushed completely. Only his upper half was left. His own son, Laser, had to pick up what was left of his father and carry him to the car to get him to hospital immediately. 
his youngest child was there, watching all of this unfold, but I don't think he was able to really comprehend what had happened at the time. Having lived very far away from the nearest hospital, they had to basically meet the ambulance halfway there in order to not lose any precious time since his father, by some miracle, was still alive, though unconscious. All the way there, his own son had to hold him in his arms and wrap him in his clothing, using his belt trying desperately to stop the bleeding as much as he could. You can imagine how much this effed him up. His father passed away, a few hours later if I remember correctly, and I was at school when this happened. Fatal familial insomnia. You slowly lose the ability to sleep and begin to physically and mentally waste away. As someone who suffers from insomnia, it absolutely terrifies me. I read somewhere, maybe in a book of deaths at the Grand Canyon, about a woman who jumped trying to commit suicide. Unfortunately she survived because she hit a ledge that wasn't quite far enough down to kill her. She had to crawl until she could find another edge to finish the deed. Yep. My uncle is a park ranger at the canyon and likes to tell people about suicide at the canyon like this. The canyon isn't just a pit with straight walls, except in a few places, so you can't just jump and fall to your death. Typically you'll hit a ledge and break some bones, and if you're lucky, fall off of that ledge and maybe break some more, and or eventually fall to your death. It's a painful death, but it's worse if you don't fall again, because if you've broken your leg or back, then you're not walking out, which means you're left in the elements. In the summer you might burn to death, in the winter you might freeze, or you might have a snake or condor or coyote lucky enough to find you and you'd make a nice snack before you die. While on a cherry picker training course we were told a guy once fell out of the basket, didn't have his harness on correctly and it lacerated his entire bowel sack open. He died in hospital soon after because he also tore a major artery in his leg. Don't know how true this is but it would be a nasty way to go. Rabies. Fine rabies. Now I am not sure of the original author of the below. I have read it many times in many different places so credit where is due. Rabies. It's exceptionally common. But people just don't run into the animals that carry it often. Skunks especially. And bats. Let me paint you a picture. You go camping. And at midday you decide to take a nap in a nice little hammock. While sleeping. A tiny brown bat. In the rage stages of infection is fidgeting in broad daylight. Uncomfortable. And thirsty. Due to the hydrophobia. And you snort. Startling him. He goes into attack mode. Except you're asleep. And he's a little brown bat, so weighs around 6 grams. You don't even feel him land on your bare knee. And he starts to bite. His teeth are tiny, hardly enough to even break the skin. But he does manage to give you the equivalent of a tiny scrape that goes completely unnoticed. Rabies does not travel in your blood. In fact, a blood test won't even tell you if you've got it. Antibody tests may be done, but are useless if you've ever been vaccinated. You wake up, none the wiser. If you notice anything at the bite site at all, you assume you just lightly scraped it on something. The bomb has been lit, and your nervous system is the wick. The rabies will multiply along your nervous system, doing virtually no damage, and completely undetectable. You literally have no symptoms. It may be for days, it may be a year, but the camping trip is most likely long forgotten. Then one day your back starts to ache, or maybe you get a slight headache, at this point. You're already dead. There is no cure. The sole caveat to this is the Milwaukee Protocol, which leaves most patients dead anyway. And the survivor's mentally disabled, and is seldom done. There's no treatment. It has a 100% kill rate. Absorb that. Not a single other virus on the planet has a 100% kill rate. Only rabies. And once you're symptomatic, it's over. You're dead. So what does that look like? Your headache turns into a fever and a general feeling of being unwell, you're fidgety, uncomfortable, and scared, as the virus that has taken its time getting into your brain finds a vast network of nerve endings, it begins to rapidly reproduce, starting at the base of your brain, where your pons is located, this is the part of the brain that controls communication between the rest of the brain and body, as well as sleep cycles, next you become anxious, you still think you have only a mild fever, but suddenly you find yourself becoming scared, even horrified, and it doesn't occur to you that you don't know why. This is because the rabies is chewing up your amygdala. As your cerebellum becomes hot with the virus, you begin to lose muscle coordination, 
and balance. You think maybe it's a good idea to go to the doctor now, but assuming a doctor is smart enough to even run the tests necessary in the few days you have left on the planet, odds are they'll only be able to tell your loved ones what you died of later. You're twitchy, shaking, and scared. You have the normal fear of not knowing what's going on. But with the virus really effing the amygdala this is amplified a hundredfold. It's around this time the hydrophobia starts. You're horribly thirsty. You just want water. But you can't drink. Every time you do, your throat clamps shut and you vomit. This has become a legitimate, active fear of water. You're thirsty. But looking at a glass of water begins to make you gag and shy back in fear. The contradiction is hard for your hot brain to see at this point. By now. The doctors we want LL have to put you on IVs to keep you hydrated. But even that's futile. You were dead the second you had a headache. You begin hearing things. Or not hearing at all as your thalamus goes. You taste sounds. You see smells. Everything starts feeling like the most horrifying acid trip anyone has ever been on. With your hippocampus long under attack. You're having trouble remembering things. Especially family. You're alone. Hallucinating. Thirsty confused, and absolutely, undeniably terrified. Everything scares the literal shout of you at this point. These strange people in lab coats, these strange people standing around your bed crying, who keep trying to get you drink something and crying, and it's only been about a week since that little headache that you've completely forgotten. Time means nothing to you anymore. Funny enough, you now know how the bat felt when he bit you. Eventually, you slip into the dumb rabies phase. Your brain has started the process of shutting down. Too much of it has been turned to liquid virus. Your face droops. You drool. You're all but unaware of what's around you. A sudden noise or light might startle you. But for the most part, it's all you can do to just stare at the ground. You haven't really slept for about 72 hours. Then you die. Always. You die. And there's not one. Fine thing anyone can do for you. Then there's the question of what to do with your corpse. I mean, sure, burying it is the right thing to do. But the fine virus can survive in a corpse for years. You could kill every rabid animal on the planet today. And if two years from now, some moist, preserved, rotten hunk of used to be brain gets eaten by an animal, it starts all over. So yeah, rabies scares the shout of me. And it's fine everywhere. Source, spent a lot of time working with rabies would still get my vaccinations if I could afford them.